Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer caught on a hot mic on the Senate floor describing his advice to President Trump to deal with both Democrats and Republicans in Congress. And it's time now for our Sunday group, former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich, Rachel Bade, who covers Congress for Politico, Julie Pace, Washington bureau chief for the Associated Press, and Guy Benson of townhall.com. Well, Mr. Speaker, you worked with Bill Clinton in the mid-1990s as he was doing what was called triangulation, trying to negotiate apart from both Republicans and his own Democratic Party. Is that what President Trump is doing here? And will it work? Well, I think Trump is an inveterate deal maker. I think that's he wants things to work. He wants to get uh, the job done. I think the other day he was faced with Two visits to Houston, terrible devastation, a hurricane coming to Florida, and he had the usual partisan infighting for two or three weeks or take a deal. And he took a deal and it worked. And I think he thought, well, maybe we'll do a little more. Now, the challenge will be that the goals of Schumer and Pelosi and their base are so radically different from Trump that the margins for deals may be smaller than people would like. But I think it's perfectly reasonable. I'd, look, I advocated for months that they start with infrastructure because it was inherently bipartisan. And I think that uh, presidents govern best when they carve a large block out of the opposition party and have, a, and have a much bigger majority than just their own partisan base. Julie, what are they saying? You cover the White House. What are they saying at the White House? How frustrated are they with Republican leaders and particularly their inability to deliver on Obamacare repeal and replace, and how much hope do they hold, given that, as I said, on, on, on a lot of the, and as the speaker said, on a lot of the basic issues, what they want in tax reform, what they want in, in uh, immigration, that there's such big differences, how much hope do they hold for a, a working alliance with the Democrats? Well, I think you have to put this in context of the relationship that the president has with McConnell and Ryan. With, with McConnell in particular, there's just not much of a relationship there. So when you come out of something like the Obamacare debates and the president sees that McConnell just can't get it over the finish line, there's not a lot of personal bonding there to kind of keep that going. So there was a lot of frustration in the White House after that specific uh, debate on the Capitol. And I think when the president looks at Schumer, more so than Pelosi, but, but Schumer in particular, you know, he sees someone he likes. And this is a president who likes the personal relationship. He, he likes to have a bond with someone. Yes, there are going to be differences on the policies. Yes, they are not going to be aligned on everything. But where he can make an agreement, I think he is perfectly fine. And he's been hearing from people like Speaker Gingrich and others around him for months that this is actually what he should do, that this is an advantage for someone like Trump, who isn't particularly ideological, who doesn't have deep roots to the conservative movement or Republican ideology. So, so when it comes to DACA, does that mean the wall? Well, maybe not. Uh, citizenship, maybe yes. I think on the wall, I mean, this is something that you've seen the president multiple times when he's had a chance to go to the mat over the wall and say, I'm going to hold up a certain piece of legislation. I'm going to veto it over this wall. He's backed off. And uh, I think that for his base, that's going to continue to be a frustration. But he's certainly shown a willingness to punt that, kick it down the road a little bit. We ask you for questions for the panel. And on this issue of the president making a deal with Democrats on DACA, there was a lot of confusion from you, as there has been here in Washington. Let's put some of it up. Fox Mulder, I love that, tweeted this. Does Trump even want to get funding for the wall, build that wall, got him elected? How else will he rally his base? And Rick Connor posted this on Facebook. How do you think amnesty for these illegals will square with the president's campaign promises? To the contrary, is this just a negotiating ploy to get his agenda through wall and all? Guy, how do you answer them? That's what everyone is trying to figure out in this town, including, I think, both senators that you just interviewed a little while ago. You know, I went back and tried to figure out maybe what would a deal start to look like on DACA? What would the contours uh, perhaps start to come together with. And I think the wall seems to be out, at least for this particular piece. He says maybe sometime in the future, unclear. But it seems like ancient history at this point. But 2013, there was the Gang of Eight bill that eventually was killed in the House. But Dem Democrats agreed in principle to a whole swath of border security and immigration enforcement provisions that I think would probably form the basis for something where Trump could potentially somewhat credibly claim a victory. And I went back and I looked at some of those provisions, $40 billion for border security, 20,000 new border security agents, 700 miles of fencing. That's a physical border. That was in gang of 
of eight agreed to in the so-called border surge. So there's a chance that while the wall might be part of a DACA deal, there could be something that could be spun as or framed as a wall or a physical barrier. And how do you think, I mean, it's crazy to ask you what's the base going to do, but I'm going to ask you, uh, what do you think the reaction of the real Trump hardliners, the real base, will be if they get a deal on DACA that includes citizenship and doesn't include a wall as it had been commonly thought to exist. Well, last week I had a long car ride, so I listened to talk radio for about six hours straight. And it was really interesting. They opened the phone lines and it was Trump-based voters calling in and there was some trepidation there was some concern about where this might go but overall there was a sense that they trust President Trump that they think that he's three steps ahead of anyone else and that ultimately he's got their interests at, at heart and that was sort of reflected across the board from most of his supporters so that's what I would guess would be the case unless it is egregiously bad uh, Rachel from your post covering Capitol Hill what do you think is the are the prospects for a deal that can be passed on DACA and the prospects for a deal on tax reform? Uh, you talk to Republicans right now, uh, they would tell you a slim chance in terms of uh, the White House striking a deal with Democrats and getting it over the line uh, while cutting out GOP leadership. You know, you mentioned that a lot of the base uh, still has faith in Trump and they see this. They say he uh, knows our interests. He's going to do what is best for us. There's a totally different feeling on Capitol Hill with GOP leadership. I heard a lot of frustration and questioning about what is this strategy, what is the end game here. Um, basically, you know, Republicans control both houses of Congress, you know, so cutting out leadership is not the smartest thing for the president at this point in time, at least Republicans will tell you that. For instance, take the DACA deal. I was talking to some uh, folks in leadership who were saying that they don't understand why he took the wall off the table to begin with. It's the number one bargaining chip they said in terms of negotiating a deal. If you're going to take it off the table with Democrats, you should get something for it. So they're going to try to push him to put that back on the table and sort of use that to get a deal that is possible that conservatives and, could and vote for. And what about it. tax reform? Because as I pointed out with the two senators, they're so different on tax cuts that would benefit the wealthy, on whether or not it's going to add to the deficit or not, unless you put in what they call dynamic scoring and include a lot of the growth that is a guess whether or not it's going to happen. Yeah, I don't mean to sound alarmist, but tax reform also in trouble right now. And it, it again, it goes back to this sort of shift we're seeing in the president going from just working re to Republicans to now wanting to work with uh, Democrats. For instance, Republicans on the Hill, Speaker Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, um, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, Gary Cohn, they've all been writing a Republican bill and they're about to unveil it. Last week, we saw the president come out and float the idea of increasing taxes on the wealthy, which blows in the face of supply side economics and goes against 100 percent against what Republicans would want to see in a tax bill. So there's a fear that he's overstepping right now in terms of reaching out to Democrats and they're concerned that this is going to undercut them and not only a Republican base, but the president and what he wants to do. Quick reaction, Speaker. Well, I, th I think the most interesting side story was Democrats won this big agreement. Everything was going to end in December. The Democrats are going to have this huge leverage because the debt ceiling ended in December. A few days later, Mitch McConnell pointed out that as the majority leader, he controlled the paper and they took out the provision Schumer most wanted. Which and was about extraordinary which, measures, which, 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 which means that they can keep the, the debt ceiling the, going till March. February or March. And he said, you know, I happen to be the majority leader and I controlled the paper and we did it on my <laughs> way. And, Sch and Schumer, faced with that reality, couldn't break, he couldn't say no. So we're a long way. This dance is going to continue for a while. Uh, I think uh, the Democrats are faced with a real risk. Do they really hate the wall more than they love the dreamers? Because if I were the president, that's the way I'd drive it. I'd say these people are so ideological, they'd rather sacrifice the dreamers. All right. Gridlock breaking out here in Washington. All right, panel, we have to take a break here. When we come back with growing tension between Washington and Silicon Valley, Powerful internet companies face talk of more government oversight. We'll bring back the panel to discuss Congress's new scrutiny of big tech. Democratic Senator Mark Warner of Virginia after Facebook admitted it sold $150,000 worth of ads in the 2016 election to groups linked to Russia, spurring investigations by both congressional committees and 
Special Counsel Robert Mueller. And we're back now with the panel. Speaker Gingrich, how big a development is this? And are we beginning to see the end of Washington's hands-off approach to big tech and especially these huge Internet companies? Yeah, look, I think this is probably four to six years behind the curve. These companies are so big, they control so much of our lives, they can set so many different policies internally with no supervision, that having not just the Russian angle, but really looking at the underlying nature of these companies, what they do, how they make decisions, these are the equivalent of gigantic public utilities. And in the information age, they have enormous power. Uh, and I don't think you, in a free society, you can have power that's hidden away in secret, controlled by a handful of billionaires. Well, one of the things that Mark Warner, who is a tech guy himself before he went into politics, said is it's the wild, wild west there. Now, some people would say that's one of the reasons it succeeded. Are you saying put government clamps on it? Look, I think having the wild, wild west when companies are small is exactly right. But several of these companies are so enormous that there's some, some sense of what does it mean to us as a free society to have global corporations run by founding billionaires who are, have been, in effect, totally out of control and who internally can wipe out a company, wipe, I mean, they can be anti-conservative, they can be anti-liberal, they can do all sorts of things, and there's been almost no supervision just to surface the information. President, uh, uh, Rachel, President Obama and Democrats, I think you'd agree, generally had a pretty cozy relationship with the big internet companies like Facebook, like Google, like Amazon. Is that changing on Capitol Hill now, as the speaker suggested it should? And is there a partisan divide in how Republicans and Democrats see these internet behemoths? Yeah, absolutely. The days of the industry sort of basking in this endless praise from Washington are, are basically coming to an end right now. Look, for a long time, Congress had sort of a light touch uh, with the tech industry, but now you have uh, Democrats who are furious about these Russia-linked uh, ads that ran in 2016. Uh, Republicans are worried that Google is oppressing conservative voices. Both sides are concerned about people's private information uh, being gathered and what happens if they're hacked. Um, and so those are all concerns. So yes, generally Republicans uh, control everything right now in Washington and they're typically anti-regulation, but it's safe to say that this sort of darling industry is now becoming a target uh, as much as anything else. And, and do you have any thought about how you do it? The rubber hits the road. How do you allow these companies to grow and prosper, but, but with some guardrails? I think that's the question that the Hill is sort of grappling with right now. How do they do this, but allow an industry to continue to grow that uh, influences everyone's life so much? Look, there's a test case uh, that's going on right now on Capitol Hill. There's going to be uh, some hearings coming up in the Senate this week to examine um, whether big websites and tech companies can be held liable um, for child sex um, trafficking on the internet. Right now, they cannot be sued you, if a user were to put illicit content on the internet. So the Senate is going to look at re-examining this. Uh, the tech industry is putting a lot of money into K Street to lobby against this. Um, but I think this is an interesting first test, right? Like if if they can't if they're not going to see something as heinous as child sex trafficking as a reason to regulate, then it's safe to say that big tech is still uh, has a lot of power. It's you talk about K Street. It is amazing, which is the big center of lobbying here in Washington. And there was a chart in the Wall Street Journal that showed the lobbying expenditures by these companies has just skyrocketed in, in the last few years. Julie, where are President Trump and his administration on this, uh, you talk about utilities, uh, Speaker Gingrich, Steve Bannon used to talk about treating Facebook and, and Google as public utilities, which meant heavy regulation. Right, Steve Bannon, of course, now outside the White House, though. Look, the, at least rhetorically, the position of this White House it, when it comes to big tech is so different from the Obama administration, which really wrapped its arms around the Googles and Amazons and Facebooks and presented them as examples of American companies that are, that are growing strong and are dominating on the global stage. Uh, Trump, I think, has been turned off a bit by the fact that some of the leaders of these companies are not particularly pleased with his administration and have spoken out on a lot of issues. I don't think you can divorce this conversation when it comes to the White House from that. But he's also taken on Amazon and not just for Jeff Bezos's role 
in owning the Washington Post. He's taken on Amazon uh, on his Twitter account. I think that you are seeing some of this stemming from the president's populist message in general as well. I mean, he looks at Wall Street and some of the big firms there and, and I think looks at tech in some somewhat of the same way, a, a massive company company that it can get out of control. And he, when he looks at his base, he can see their frustration with that, the, the frustration of small business owners who see themselves getting taken over by a giant like Amazon. Yeah, there's also this whole question, <clears throat> before I get to you, Guy, about the fact that internet companies, when they have sales, they don't have to pay taxes, but the mom and pop store in the town on Main Street does have to pay taxes. And that's taxes. what you've seen him go after Amazon in particular for. He's on this in a, in a series of tweets. I think it'll be interesting to see if this comes up in the discussion on the Hill on tax reform, if we are do end up talking about a big tax reform package. That would actually add a lot of revenue, wouldn't it? Indeed. That would really, that, that would get the <laughs> lobbyists busy. Guy, there's another aspect of all of this that I want to get to, and that's growing questions about the culture in Silicon Valley. You had three former female employees uh, of Google just file what they hope will be a, a class action lawsuit charging them with pay and promotion discrimination. And as you know, there have been a number of complaints and lawsuits alleging sexual harassment in, in these companies. So that wild, wild west attitude uh, uh, applies also to the culture in Silicon Valley. That's right. So you'll have Democrats in particular, I think, focusing on those problems and equal pay and is there discrimination in Silicon Valley. And then you'll have on the other side, as Rachel alluded to, a lot of conservatives and Republicans look at what happened at Mozilla a few years ago and Brendan Eich ousted from that, that company for having traditional views on marriage and then the firing of that engineer at Google. Uh, is there rampant discrimination in terms of viewpoints against conservatives and how might that play out in terms of um, average users having information potentially stifled in searches. There are real concerns about that on the right. So big tech might be waking up these days and saying, uh-oh, we have real problems culturally on the left and the right in this country, and that could be a problem for us on Capitol Hill as lawmakers on both, star, uh, both sides rather start to dig in. But I, I want to pick up on something that I asked Speaker Gingrich, because there's no question that these companies have been engines of huge economic growth in this country. Is there a downside to Washington, or obviously there's a downside, how big a downside is there to Washington getting more involved in regulation of the internet? A huge downside. I think some of the concerns that the speaker raised are fair and reasonable and people would agree with them. My faith in the ability of government to respond to that well through regulation is very low. I think it is government it is slow moving, it is the opposite of innovative, and the internet is a miracle, and it wouldn't exist as it does today if the government's clumsy hand had been on its neck from day one. And I think putting more hand on the neck and applying more pressure from DC, I'm just not sure that works out well. 15 seconds to respond, Speaker. First of all, the internet was created by ARPANET, a Department of Defense project. Second, uh, the fact is, there's no time in American history when huge concentrations of power are not directly challenged by government, and that's overall been good for protecting our liberty. All right, we'll continue this debate. I, this is an important subject, and we'll keep talking about it. Thank you, panel. We'll see you next Sunday. Up next, our Power Player of the Week, the doctor.